of sports deals. And we have a really interesting position in esports, being in Los Angeles, the center of esports. And we really get a 360 degree view of everything that's happening within the esports industry. So before I begin, I'm just going to ask everyone to raise your hand if you know what esports is. Yay! Everyone, almost everyone here knows what esports is. But chances are pretty good you're going to learn something even deeper about esports today. But for those of you who may not know, I'm going to go ahead and let The Rock tell you. HBO's Ballers, which has teams competing at the LCS studio as they try their hand at League of Legends. Gaming accounts now for over $100 billion in revenue. Games are overhyped and overvalued. Just the white record exists says about hip hop. That is the meanest thing anyone's ever said to me, you monster. I'm only white on the outside. <laughs> Life is all about getting outside of your comfort zone. Make a game, it should be my next career. We gotta get you focused on your day job. I wanna try something new. Staying committed to what you believe doesn't come easy. Esports? You're League of Legends, right? You must be a player. Are you serious about being a professional gamer? I like to play. <laughs> Welcome to League of Legends. To the victor goes the spoils. Hey, last dash, you only had us play that trailer because you have, like, two words in it, right? <laughs> Alright, well, as we saw here, esports is competitive video games. And... Yep, esports is competitive video games, and not all video games can be esports. What makes a game an esports game, it has to be competitive in nature, multiplayer, and have a fan base big enough to warrant tournaments and leagues. And the way this works in uh, an industry is that there are multiple games that are considered esports. League of Legends, Overwatch, CSGO, Smash, Call of Duty. And there are single players and up to teams of six squads who play these games competitively. And those squads and individuals are managed by what we call organizations or boards. So a few up here you might recognize. Base Clan, 100 Thieves, Team Liquid. And these orgs draft a roster of both players and influencers depending on their brand identity and what they're trying to achieve. So what's the difference between players and influencers? While players may stream and influencers may compete, it really depends on what their primary function is. So players primarily compete in esports tournaments and leagues for prize money. Whereas influencers primarily entertain using social media and streaming platforms to distribute gaming and esports content. So why might an org want both? The answer is to compete for esports winnings, to showcase their partners, to develop digital content, and then ultimately to develop that brand identity. So how do these orgs make money? Esports teams don't have giant stadiums. You know, they don't have the Chase Center. They don't have merch, ticket sales, concessions, and all of these different streams of revenue. So actually, 82% of revenue coming into an esports team is coming from those sponsorships, be them endemic or non-endemic. And that's actually increased by about 35% since 2019. So sponsors are becoming more and more excited about entering the esports space, and that that whole industry is growing. So how does a professional esports team develop that brand identity when esports as an entire industry is less than 15 years old? Well, professional teams have taken a variety of different approaches to this question. Some teams prioritize performance in their resources, while others prioritize gaming and lifestyle content. And how do brands, when they're entering the esports space, know that they're aligning with the right teams? Well, why are brands interested in esports at all? Mainly, it's just two factors. Number one, eyeballs, impressions, people watching day to day on stream and on Twitch. And then number two, the millennials, the Gen Z demographic. How do we reach these kids, right? And then ultimately, when brands are working and determining what teams to work with, it comes down to a few different criteria. So streaming impressions. How many impressions is a particular team or player getting across uh, the streaming platforms? Team culture and fan base. What does it mean to be a, a fan or a member of Face Clan? Social reach. So uh, across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, how many engagements are they getting from their fans? And then the big question, and ultimately the elephant in the room, brand safety. 
Is the brand okay with activating with a team who has a Call of Duty, a CSGO, an FPS-based roster of games? A lot of big questions for brands to consider. So let's look at the top teams by social footprint. So Gum Gum Sports put together and ranked all of the top 10 esports teams by their social followers across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And we pulled together some overall statistics about their sponsorships and who are sponsoring these teams. We found a pretty equal distribution between endemic and non-endemic sponsorships, and I can get into what we mean by endemic and non-endemic here in a second. But overall, we found that these teams have an average of six sponsors. So compare this list to the top teams by esports winnings. You'll see some different teams on this list. Definitely a lot more international teams here. But what's interesting is when we look at the data um, statistics by sponsors. A similar number of sponsors, a little bit more, but a way heavier distribution of sponsors towards the endemic side. Overall, however, they have the same average number of sponsors as the, as the top teams by social footprint. So what do we mean by endemic and non-endemic sponsors in esports? It really comes down to what that product, what is that company's brand looking to sell? Um, is it made specifically for the gaming, esports, and technology space? Or is it an outside brand, like an automotive brand, quick serve restaurant, soda brand, who's interested in entering esports not to have the uh, players specifically showcase their products necessarily, but access those two factors I talked about before. So this breaks down all of the different sponsorships by the top teams by esports social footprint. And you'll see here, you know, there's a very interesting distribution of sponsors in the non-endemic space. And what, what do these all have in common? and comparing this list also to the distribution by esports winnings. This is a very different look. A lot fewer non-endemic brands are activating in the list of teams who are on that top teams by esports winnings list when you really consider why are these brands activating. By social footprint, those non-endemic brands are looking to access, thus, well, obviously, the social footprint. The impressions, engagements, all of the social activity that's happening with these teams. Whereas, for esports winnings, all those endemic brands are looking for the top teams in esports to showcase their products. They want to see Double Lift winning in uh, Worlds with using an Alienware product. So let's look at some of the top teams on these lists. What are they doing and how are they branding themselves? How are they standing out? So let's look at Face Clan. You might have heard of them in the news. They have their number one ranked on the social footprint list with 151.1 million social followers across their platforms. They have six esports teams uh, specifically focusing on FPS and sports games. And this team has so many influencers on their roster. We asked them and they didn't know. They couldn't tell us. Their list of influencers ranges from popular streamers and online celebrities to athletes and musicians. So these are a few photos from their Instagram. And what do these photos tell you about this brand? They say young, hip hop, clout, ultimately lifestyle. And that's where Face Clan has focused their resources in developing this lifestyle content that engages young viewers and makes these non-endemic sponsors interested in activating. Comparing that content to a team like Team Liquid. Number one on the esports winnings list, uh, 15 very successful esports teams, but also no ranked number seven on the social footprint list. And this team has no influencers on their roster. So how are that, they that high up in the social footprint? Well, Team Liquid has taken a bit of a different approach to social to creating content. Instead of drafting a roster of influencers, Team Liquid actually works with One Up Studios to develop short and long-form documentary series featured on Netflix in the Baller special that you just saw, and creating content that's um, made quite a lot of headway in their uh, social media. So what do their photos say to you? Competition, winning, success. You'll see a Marvel sponsorship down here. Actually, Team Liquid was sponsored by Marvel and Disney. So looking at these two teams, one focusing on lifestyle content, one focusing on performance, what is a team doing 
that's on both lists and has taken a completely different approach. So here we have team vitality. So this team has risen in the ranks over the past two years through the success of their CSGO and uh, League of Legends teams, but have taken kind of a different approach to branding themselves. One approach they've taken is leveraging their players as influencers. There's a player by the name of Godega, who's a French uh, player who has amassed a huge following on social media. But on top of that, Team Vitality has branded themselves as the premier esports team of France. They're one of the few esports teams really taking advantage of regional identity, which is hard to do when esports is based digitally. So what I want you to take away and remember from this. First of all, that esports is huge. It's a hundred billion dollar industry. And brands are really excited to activate in this space. They already are. They're activating to access those eyeballs and target, targeted demographics. And teams need sponsorships. 80% of their revenue is coming from sponsorships. So how can a team ensure that they're creating a winning team performance, an awesome fan base, while also attracting sponsors? Well, let's look at what the high, highest performing teams are doing. Higher, teams with higher social footprint tend to attract more non-endemic sponsors, whereas teams with a higher performance tend to attract more endemics. But overall, the most important thing to remember is that all of these top teams are investing in content creation, digital content, whether it's promoting those players as influencers or creating their own uh, studio all of these teams understand the value of creating digital content for their sponsors. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Sure. Sure, I can go over that again. So um, endemic sponsors, um, well, their brand is specifically made and targeted towards gaming and esports. So for example, Alienware, Intel, Corsair, PC brands, peripherals, you know, nice keyboards, software companies, websites, you know, things that are geared more towards gaming and tech, as opposed to non-endemics where the brands are not necessarily targeted toward the, the, towards gaming and esports, so automotive brands, snack foods, etc. So the question was, why haven't we seen more financial services brands activating in esports? I think the main answer is uh, there isn't a lot of education out there right now. Uh, we saw we are seeing Cash App right now activating with Hundred Thieves and gaining huge success because Cash App knows exactly what demographic they're trying to target, the people who are using their brand. So for me, it's getting those brands to understand that this is a really important channel to target for future customers and helping them understand what are the correct ways to activate in this space. Um, with Call of Duty now transitioning to like a franchise-based model following the footsteps like Overwatch and League of Legends, mm -hmm. um, how do you think like investors are now looking at between the franchise model and now CSGO and like other like Smash focusing more on like tournament space? Sure, that's a great question. So um, he was bringing up how are sponsors looking at the difference between investing in uh, league-based models like Overwatch League or Call of Duty versus tournament-based models like CSGO and Smash? Well, what's interesting is we're in a really interesting test phase right now. We're watching Overwatch League, we're watching uh, tournaments, and we're really seeing the differences. And I think it really comes down to the access that sponsors have to sponsorship opportunities in those spaces. Because generally, leagues are controlled by the publishers, those publishers hold a lot more uh, rights to um, league-wide sponsorships and deals generally tend to restrict that. Whereas with tournament-based games like CSGO, Valve has a lot less um, involvement there. They're not uh, controlling sponsorship categories, so there are a lot more opportunities for brands to come in and work with teams independently. Any other questions for us? Sure. So, um, speaking on the sort of like growth of esports, um, like what sort of opportunities do you see for agency of like advocating for these players since a lot of them are being leveraged as influencers? Mm -hmm. um, like what sort of opportunities do you see moving forward for these players to grow as influencers while also growing as better players? And how do you think that can be tapped into? Great question. So, his question was about leveraging players as influencers or if, and if there are agencies out there working in that right now. 
I actually used to work for one of those agencies. Um, I worked for an agency called Evolve Talent. They're out in Los Angeles. Uh, they're the premier um, esports player representation firm. Um, and that is a system, you know, they're working out the kinks in it, obviously figuring out the best way to represent players, um, both um, in their gameplay and then also in their um, endorsements and in the content that they, they create. Uh, really, it comes down to, you know, also working. There are some player unions that have started, others that are trying to form, um, you know, really working with the space as a new space and understanding uh, what are the most meaningful ways to get players uh, the payment that they need and getting the boards the payment that they need, not making the same mistakes that we're making sports. Any other questions? This is curious, you said it's 100 billion in global revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but the top 20 team just won $2 million. Just wondering why it's so low. I mean, a top golfer, just one individual golfer, one individual tennis player will make, make much more than $2 million. I'm just wondering why the winnings are so low and the revenue is so big, $100 billion, $100 billion of global revenue. I would say the answer to that, um, probably the highest, actually the highest prize pool right now is in Dota. There's a $24 million prize pool, so that's... You know, the prize pool and winnings in esports are raising every year. It really comes into, you know, what brands and outside sources are willing to activate and donate and put money into those prize winnings. Um, and then just the industry itself, that encompasses as well, you know, like the whole streaming and influencer element. So outside of just the game itself, outside of just, you know, what you could potentially win in esports, that also encompasses the whole streaming network as well. I mean, these sponsor dollars and the investments that are going into uh, those players as influencers as well. Thank you. Question down here in the front. Sure. Uh, could you address a little bit more the sponsorship, let's say, between the difference of Asia esports market and the and then EU esports market, and especially considering a lot of these influencers have much bigger influence at globally instead of regionally. So mm -hmm. how do you see that play difference for the sponsor? I would say, um, and just looking at the charts, that I had before, um, I think the answer to your question really there is you're asking kind of what does the sponsorship landscape look like in terms of sponsorship in esports between Asia and uh, the West. I would say just the focus on which brands are activating and why. Um, you know, this team list for social foot footprint has a lot more non endemics that are really interested in that social reach, whereas the list by esports winnings, you'll see a lot of international teams, a lot of endemic sponsors who are really choosing strategically to activate, not specifically for that social reach, but for uh, the players themselves winning and achieving with their products. Any other questions? Well, listen, thank you so much, Tia and Neha.